All right, um, begin uh, one trigger warning. Uh, we are gonna be talking about some Old Testament uh, readings uh, and, uh, or Old Testament stories um, that include um, sex and include uh, oppression. And so just be mindful of that if you need to leave, um, if that is too much for whatever reason, feel free to go hang out with the two-year-olds in the nursery, or um, I would encourage you to take a walk. It is uh, lightening up a bit, but, um, and also I or Leishan are available afterwards as well. Like I said, our overarching theme for this Advent is from generation to generation, contemplating how we have been handed the story of Jesus and how we hand it on. And throughout this season and into Epiphany, we will ponder questions about how the characters we encounter in the story hand on their understanding of how God is at work in the world through this specific event of the incarnation and other events beyond. But we start out this season with a reading that is maybe a little on the nose for a series called Generation to Generation. It's a full genealogy of Jesus that starts with Abraham and goes for 42 generations. It's a lot of names uh, and some will stick out and some will wash over you. Um, but I just encourage you to get comfortable and to listen to God's words about generations and see if anything pops up for us in this generation. Hear God's word. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashan, and Nashan the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. Part one, part two. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. That was part two, now part three. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Zelophiel, and Zelophiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azer, and Azer the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who bore Jesus who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. What did you notice in that very long list of names that I totally know how to pronounce? <laughs> That's the secret, guys, is you just, uh, you just pretend like, you know, right? Like, and say it with confidence. Kathy, what'd you notice? You did not count correctly, but we'll get to the, what, uh, there are five women, yes? You probably all noticed the big names, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Josiah, maybe, if you're like really into the king era. Yeah. And that is intentional on Matthew's part. Matthew or whoever wrote the gospel that we call Matthew, we just say Matthew um, for ease, wants to tell a story that draws the line from the founding of Israel to Jesus to solidify his legitimacy as the Messiah, the chosen one. And that legitimacy is supposed to come from the house of the great King David. 
Diana Butler Bass, uh, writer and theologian in her book, Grounded, says this about this particular genealogy, which I will say differed significantly from the one in Luke, but that's like a whole other Bible study. Um, but she says this about this genealogy. The writer of Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. The claim is big and bold, directed toward a Jewish audience seeking both political liberation and spiritual empowerment during a time of oppression. Matthew proclaims that this Jesus, whose story he tells, embodied both King David's royal authority and the covenantal authority of Abraham, end quote. So this story is supposed to help us understand Jesus with these two important thread in, um, in the Jewish understanding, especially in early Christianity, seeking to hand down to the generations a story that is hopeful, a story that is rooted in the shared tradition that those who are hearing and reading this gospel early on would have noticed and longed for. But what I noticed, what Kathy noticed, what lots of feminist and womanist theologians, maybe it, if you are in a female body, you're just like more prone to hearing these names because they stick out to you. But we uh, find five sort of, um, sort of names of women. We have Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, who doesn't get named, she's wife of Uriah, that's rude, but yeah and um, Mary. Now we'll talk about Mary a lot in coming weeks, but so I wanna focus on the four women of Hebrew scriptures that are named because these women's stories are not stories that emulate like the best parts of humanity. <laughs> All four of these women from the Hebrew scriptures endure the worst of patriarchy and xenophobia and violence. And yet here they are in a list of people that have shaped the very incarnation of the Messiah and of God's work. So what is the story Matthew is telling by including them? Let's review the stories fairly quickly. There is a way to do Advent where you give each of these women their own week and maybe we will do that in the future, but for this year, we're going to go lightning speed through these. So Tamar's story is told in Genesis 38. This is the one that you probably don't know, right? This is the one that you're like, I have no idea who Tamar is because we gloss over this part when we learn Genesis in Sunday school, and then we never circle back to it, right? So Genesis um, 38 is Tamar's story. She was the daughter-in-law of Judah, oldest son of the 12, right? Um, her husband died before they conceived, and so through Levirate law, through the um, ways in which that society worked, she would have married uh, his brother. Um, she did marry Onan for a time. If you grew up in certain evangelical circles, you know Onan, right? Uh, <laughs> use that guy. Um, so he died, and then she was then promised to the third brother, who was too young to get married. So Judah said, oh, don't worry, Tamar. Just wait, and when he grows up, we'll get you married off. She waits a long time. And Judah does his like nomadic thing, goes and with the flocks around, and then comes back around with a grown up son and no intention of following up on his promise. So Tamar takes matters into her own hands. Disguised as a sex worker, she sleeps with Judah because, you know. He just saw a sex worker and I guess said, okay, well, uh, tricks him into giving her his signet ring, the ring and cord that were his, that everyone knew were his, and she conceived twins. When word got around that she was pregnant and Judah attempts to have her killed for infidelity, she produces that ring and cord, and makes a big old fool of Judah and get, claims her place in this genealogy. I love that she's included in this line because her wily ability to see systems and to undercut them and to name oppression in new ways reminds me of ways that Jesus will face and make foolish other systems of impression that he will encounter in his life. Next up is Rahab. 
you've probably heard her name around, yes? Uh, it's Her story is found in Joshua 2, if you want to read up on it. She was actually a sex worker, uh, and not just a sex worker, but one in charge of her own house. She owned her own business. Um, uh, she owned the whorehouse, yeah? And uh, that was what she uh, did for business. So when the Israelites were coming into the promised land and were spying on the city of Jericho, because they had to like go and conquer it, right? That's a whole other question. Um, but as they were planning on doing that, they just happened upon the whorehouse as their <laughs> first. <laughs> um, and, but she came and she sheltered them. She kept their secrets. She didn't let the king of Jericho and his soldiers know who they were and what their plans were. And so for her faithfulness, she and her family all belong to her is what scripture says. Presumably a bunch of sex workers were all taken out of the city and spared while Joshua fought that battle in Jericho and while the walls came tumbling down, there were all the sex workers saved because of Rahab's faithfulness. I think she is so crucial to this genealogy because she is the epitome of one who listened and knew of God from the underside of society. And I think perhaps because he carried her story in his very flesh and blood, Jesus has an affinity, a compassion for sex workers, for those presumed to be sex workers, for those on the underside. And so I think it's not just because he knows the story from scripture, but because he carries it in his body that shapes Jesus and his work in the world. Ruth is the third woman named, you know, her. she has a whole book. She's like so fancy, right? Um, if you know her, remember her, she's the Moabite woman whose Hebrew husband dies and she chooses to stay with her mother-in-law, Naomi, go from the land of Moab to back to Israel with her. It's the book where we get the great line that we um, quote often in uh, weddings, uh, where you go, I will go, your people shall be my people, your God, my God. And what we don't quote at weddings is then she has to sneakily kind of trick Naomi's cousin Boaz into sleeping with her and marrying her so that she can then be part of the line, produce an heir um, for Naomi for this line that is really close to uh, King David. Ruth is an important story in the scriptures and in Jesus's genealogy because she is in many ways an outsider. There were laws on the books about how you don't marry foreigners especially those Moabites right and yet here she is a Moabite woman central to the lineage that produced King David and Jesus because of her story because her story is his story I believe Jesus knew in his bones that borders and nationalities play very little part in God's reign and vision for the world and we see the ways in which he lives that out in his ministry he doesn't care about what, where one is from, in fact, um, uses that to, again, undermine those systems. And finally, we have Bathsheba. If you have any familiarity with the story of King David, you know Bathsheba. I'm going to summarize it pretty plainly in a way that your Sunday school teacher did not. David saw Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop, which is where the bathtubs were, kidnapped her, raped her, and had her husband killed to cover up his crime. Bathsheba, especially in comparison to the other women on this list, had no agency in how her body was used by those in power. Here's what womanist scholar, Reverend Will Gaffney has to say. Quote, if Jesus is the son of David, then he is every bit as much the son of Bathsheba. But if we were to tell the truth, Jesus looks a whole lot less like David and a whole lot more like Bathsheba. Both body snatched by soldiers and handed over to someone who did whatever they wanted to their bodies. Jesus and Bathsheba bore different crosses, but it was David who nailed her to hers. End quote. I encourage you to go online and look up 
Will Gaffney's sermon, Son of Bathsheba, um, it is stunning. Um, so, but because Jesus's line goes through Bathsheba, because it goes through this woman who whose very body carried oppression. We see not only her reflection in the people he cared for, the oppressed, but also in the way he lived in solidarity, going toward the oppressed rather than toward those in power. These four stories are highlighted here, maybe because they were like big names, right? We even 2000 years later, like kind of sort of knew most of them. Uh, and so they would be cultural touchstones on this really long list. But even more, I think they are included to say that Jesus not only carries the authority of Abraham and David in his lineage, but also carries the trauma of oppressed people and the resilience of women like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba. Many of us are coming off a holiday where perhaps we uh, keenly saw cycles of trauma and healing or not so healing in our families and how they play out and shape us, right? We have a balance right between the wonderful things that our families pass along to us and the things we would rather forget, the wounds that we carry. I think maybe many people would rather forget that Jesus holds in his very human DNA ties to women who undermined and schemed and revealed the worst parts of a racist patriarchal society. But I don't think Jesus forgot that. We see echoes of their spirits in his solidarity with the oppressed with his care for those left on the margins, for his willingness to go and be at the point of death in solidarity with those society would rather have gone and out of sight. And in his resurrection and the ways in which he brings new life, he brings redemption and resilience. He reflects the resilience of those women for all, of all who came before of his ancestors and offers them redemption as well, even David. As we go through this season of Advent, I hope we will reflect on the people who have shaped us, those whose stories we know and those who we don't know because, right, family secrets are a thing. Those we keep buried and hidden, may this be a time of uncovering. May our time of waiting for the Christ child to come be a time of thinking the ways we will tell our children of those who have gone before us. In the um, devotional that we have, Reverend Lauren Wright Pitt Pittman um, has a work, uh, an artwork called Genealogy of Christ. And this is what she says in her artist statement. These women only wanted to ensure safety for themselves and for their children. In the process, they ensured the continuation of the lineage of Christ. Without their brilliance, passion, ingenuity, resourcefulness, creativity, and sacrifice, the lineage would have ended. And we would not know God with us in the same way that we do now. So may we, as Christ did, embody that same brilliance, passion, ingenuity, resourcefulness, creativity, and sacrifice for the sake of the world that God is calling us to love. Amen.